Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful. And for the faithful, I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. I, I'm on a little holiday here. And I, my, re- my rest of my family is enjoying the day in Banff. And I think I should have went with them uh, from my hotel room rather than watch that game. But... It's, this is a definite watch what you wish for a moment for, for Oilers fans. Hoping for the playoffs, here they are. And man, the Oilers laid a stinker of an egg. Boy, that was a rotten game. They lose 6-4 to the Blackhawks. A game that quickly got out of hand with the Blackhawks up 4-1 to after the first period. Bruce, this is our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast. And because it was a... Oilers loss and a particularly rancid one. We're going to go with two bad things each um, for the Oilers, and and it's not hard to do in the least. Not hard to do. Uh, I'm going to. I'll start it off with with one that we both were fighting over as a bad thing this game. And you know, Bruce, this is. Have we had Dave Tippett as a bad thing all year long? I don't think can, so. Can you remember a game where Dave? Tippett was the bad thing? Well, I, no, I can't. I certainly can't remember a game where we had to thumb wrestle over who got to name him a bad thing. <laughs> so but, uh, I watched, He had a bad game. He did. Every bet he made, every bet Dave Tippett made almost didn't pay off. And I'm going to go with the two big ones to start. And, and the, the obvious, the really obvious one um, was the who you're going to start in net. And I think Oiler fans were quite encouraged when Koskinen started in net in, against Calgary in the exhibition game. They thought, oh, well, he played really well. He didn't let it any goals. Yeah. Um, he's, he was statistically the better goalie all season long. And stylistically, Bruce, what I really liked about the idea of Koskinen starting against Chicago is Chicago is not a dump and chase team. They're a team that makes plays and takes a lot of shots, outside shots, shots from the all over the place. And Koskinen, I just think, is the better shot blocker. So I thought, yeah, that really makes sense with Koskinen. So who do we see in that? Like, and um, we're going to get into his play later. But suffice it to say, that bet did not pay off for the Oilers. The other bet was a less obvious one, and it's, but it's one I've been complaining about uh, right from word go. And that's the breaking up of the dynamite line, Bruce. You have a line in... Dry Settle, Yamamoto, and Ryan Nugent Hopkins, which was the best line in the NHL, in a significant sample size over two months. And you don't play them. You don't go with them because you're trying to find balance. And, you know, it looked like maybe that was going to work. You know, against Calgary, both lines seem to be okay. But if you have a line like that, that just kicks the stuffing consistently out of the opposition team, and they're forced to stop those guys, do everything they can to stop them. And then you can throw out Connor McDavid with whoever. Why don't you do that? Why didn't you do that? And he didn't do that. And neither of those lines, it turns out, neither of the two lines that he, 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 that that, uh, Tippett came up with in the end were any good. And um, I don't know. You just, he, he was trying to get, he was trying to get plus two instead of plus one and then a maybe. And he got, Net minus two in in terms of those lines. You got instead of one line, you know you know it's going to be good that dynamite line. So far, and finally, in in game, McDavid versus Taves uh, was really hammering the orders. Now, what it, what did you see there on the stat line, Bruce? With with when those guys are out, uh, when McDavid line was facing the Taves line. Well, what I saw was a red light go on two times. <laughs> they, they they only played. Uh, I looked it up, and it seemed like Taves was owning. Uh, whoever he was checking, but uh, he played two minutes and 13 seconds against McDavid, during which time the Hawks outshot Edmonton 4 nothing and outscored him 2 nothing, and basically dominated play and put the puck in the net twice. And that was, uh, uh, that didn't uh, end too well. And then uh, uh, Taves, I mean, he had a great game. He was, uh, he was the, uh, uh, you know, he was the guy for Chicago. I mean, uh, Drysaddle didn't have much better success against him other than they didn't get scored on when uh, that matchup happened. And meantime, the Taves line with Dominic Kublik, who had an outstanding game, 
Uh, they just made mincemeat out of uh, uh, both Edmonton's, well, of their top line and their vaunted penalty kill. Yeah, the, the you know, having McDavid out there for a defensive zone face-off against Jonathan Taves, when, when you have last line change, I'm not, mm-hmm. I don't know what Tippett was thinking. Why would you do that? You yeah. have, you have the drive side line you can put out there. You have the Shan line you can put out there. You even have Juju Kara who you could put out there, uh, you know, a big guy. And I don't know, like that's the last matchup you'd want. And so I don't know why Tippett did that. The other, the only other thing I would say about the team is that the, the orders came out there and I don't know if this is on the coach or the players, but it certainly, you could put it on file it under the coach. They were so jittery coming out there. Oh. They, they, in the first couple of minutes, there was a couple bonehead defensive plays, a uh, bad pinch by, bad pinch by uh, Clef- Clef- Bond, bad pinch by Nurse in the first 50 seconds of the game. Led to two odd man rushes for Chicago in the first one minute of play. And it finally, the jitters all come together. All those jitters come together in a shift where first Clef bomb. Did, did he just throw that puck in the slaughter to the Chicago guy, beat him to it anyway? The puck. Clefbaum's on it. It looked to me like Clefbaum passed it straight into the slot. And then a second later, this this will be a segue to your first bad thing, Bruce. Um, a, a few moments later, what happens next? Okay. Uh, my first bad thing is the car, has to be the brutal net mining of Mike Smith in this game. Yes. Uh, the chosen one who was last seen in Chicago getting blown out for four goals in the first half of the game, a game the Oilers came back to lose 4-3 uh, when Kostman cleaned up that mess and, and didn't allow any in, kept the Oilers in the game, but they couldn't quite tie it up. Sound familiar? And basically we had the same story today where Smith didn't even last half the game, allowing five goals on 23 shots. So if you want to put those two games together, it's like under under 60 minutes of action, nine goals against on 44 shots. Well, I'm going to particularly reef on the first goal where the Oilers, after that jittery start, they got a sort of free power play by a too many men penalty, and they scored, and they had a one nothing lead. And I thought, oh, good, maybe we'll have a chance to sort of stabilize this. And even with one nothing lead, I was, I was kind of jittery myself because I just didn't like what I was seeing. And then our cagey veteran netminder, uh, Mike Smith, goes out behind the net to play a puck, chips it away from every oiler directly to the nearest Chicago player. Then he slides past his own goal post. So instead of sealing off the post, he slides past it, leaving a nice big butt cheek hanging out so that the guy can bounce the puck off the net and into the, off, the, off of him and into the net. Like, I don't know if it's possible to make a worse play as a goalie. And what Smith made on that. And it was one to one, and that was it for the lead. The Oilers never, you know, I mean, minutes later it was 4 1, for Pete's sake. And it was, oh my God, what it a was play just hide stuff. your eye stuff. No, like, no, he thought Clef, did you think Clefbaum was there? Is that it? Did he think? Because Clefbaum was back, and then he, he Clefbaum thought, oh, Kane's over on this side. I better go cover him. So he, he, Smith didn't look, though. He yeah, went and he played the puck, and he, did, he just, he could have just put it up the boards to Larson. Of course, Larson was kind of a little bit lollygag. The whole Larson the whole game was lolly. He was a step behind the whole game. But anyway, Smith was just Bruce. Well, the Chicago announcer it, stay in your net. The Look Chicago announcer said he he didn't he could only blame Smith for one of the goals. But man, the the last power play goal. He's way back in the net there. I mean, come on, you gotta you gotta get out on an outside shot. He's way back in the net. Oh, and the and the I think it's the fourth goal. Um, I don't know who scored it, but it was it was just a terrible. Def- McDavid starts that off with a turnover, and then there's mistakes by Larson and Clefbaum. Clefbaum, they don't, you know, Larson's out of the play. He follows the guy behind the net when he really didn't even need. He should, you know, he ain't gonna score from behind the net like you always cover the front of the net. Anyway, they're all puck watching, but Smith had it. That the, the, the pass out came right through the crease mm-hmm. on that play, and Smith should have cut that off. He should have cut off that pass. So I, I had him as a major culprit on three of the goals. And and one was just, of course, was mind-blowing. It was completely horrible. gross, yeah, the first one. Yes. Was just, I felt so bad for, like, that's, Smith yeah. only did that, what, three or four times all year, Bruce. This is a very bad moment for that, because he's going to do that every, every now and then, right? But he, it only happened about, I'm going to say, four times all year. Yeah. But it happened there. 
it happened there and this was one of those games where he just didn't have it this was like one of the one of those games he played in december you know where he just was i mean i'm just going to talk about just sloppy net mining i didn't think his puck handling was good i didn't think he tracked the puck well there was a couple of shots that he never even saw that missed the net you know there was uh there was he was kind of flopping around and and not really square and and you know his technique in this game was dreadful he was okay against the flames i'll give him that yeah. but mm-hmm. in yeah. the yeah. other preseason in the preseason preseason scrimmages he looked like this he was really jittery and fighting the puck where koskinen was looking good fairly consistently and yeah so bruce that was you know i i don't know you knew everyone everyone was, i was thinking all along that Smith was going to start because he's mm-hmm. Tippett's guy. And then, but then when, when Koskinen went in, I, my hopes got up and I'm thinking, Oh, you know, good for you, coach. You, you've gone with what I want. So you must be doing the right thing. But uh, anyway, 100% chance he goes with Koskinen on Monday night. I'll oh, say there's, that. There's no doubt about it. And we'll see, see how Koskinen does. So hopefully yeah. uh, that, that stat, about the five game series where the team that loses the first one loses 82% of the time. That's a kind of a fearsome stat, but you know what? It's, this is a different situation. These teams are coming off a huge long layoff and um, we'll, maybe that stat's not going to hold. I, 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 Bruce, I do think the Oilers, I'm going to say this, I think they're the better team. And I think there's, they can, if they get some things right, including number one, the goaltending, if they get some things right, they can win this series. But um, what's what's your uh, other bad thing? Let's just go right there. Okay. Well, I, I got to go with the penalty kill. Edmonton's yeah. bonded penalty kill that was uh, so good this year. It just had a terrible afternoon. They couldn't win a face-off for starters, so they spent the, the PK starting in their own zone and chasing the puck around. And they just, you know, they couldn't win battles. They couldn't box out the front of their net. I mean, there was one goal that was tipped home where there was two Chicago guys on the edge of the blue paint and the two other defensemen were like 10 feet in front of them. And if they were fronting the shot, they weren't in the, you know, they weren't in the <laughs> in the shooting lane. So I'm not quite sure what they were accomplishing other than uh, it was, uh, yeah, just, just a difficult afternoon. Let's see what Chicago had. Uh, 13 shots on the power play. 13 shots on the, the power play. Three of them the, went in. The first power play goal, Bruce. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. They had, it was like it was right out of the Dallas Aikens era with four mm-hmm. players in the corner. I mean, mm-hmm. Larson, why was Larson? He was in, in the, the wrong corner. corner. Mm-hmm. He goes way charging over. They're not going to score from the corner. You know, like, like, like we having talked to Playfair, the, the mm-hmm. shorthanded coach, we know what they're trying to do. They're trying to funnel, to funnel them to the corner and win pucks there. But it's, it's, you, you have to make the right reads. You, you go to that corner when you think you can win that puck. Larson wasn't even playing the puck when he went over to that corner. He just went into that corner and hammered a guy. But when he's doing that, he's totally leaving the slot open. And then Nugent Hopkins, um, he gets sucked down there because Someone's got to play the guy who's getting the, you know, there's a chance. It was kind of a 50-50 puck or a 60-40 puck. So Nuge has to try it. But then there's no one there at all in the slot for the wide open goal scorer. That was just a horrendous sequence. And it, and it was a, but it was a rusty penalty kill. It was a mm-hmm. penalty kill that was not in midseason form. It was in preseason form. I, I'll say that. That's what it looked like to me. Yeah, well, the Oilers, I mean, you want to talk about rusty or, or sloppy. I mean, you can put the, the goaltending, the defensive play, and the penalty killing and put them all in that same category. Yeah. Like, I just thought the team was way substandard in all three of those. And you're not going to win too many games that you give in six goals, obviously. And, and those six goals, I mean, they, you know, Chicago earned many of the goals and, and the Oilers gifted them one or two. And, and, uh, you know, I, I, no argument from me that the better team won this game. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that's the case. And, I mean, Chicago badly outshot Edmonton for the fourth time in four games this year, I'll add. 42 to 29, Chicago had a big advantage on the shot clock. So that's uh, that's nothing new. But giving up over 40 shots is, uh, is uh, just simply not good enough. 
two bad luck goals, you know, deflected in. The 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 uh, third goal was a killer, right? Like you know, bouncing around, bouncing. The guy in. took it out. The guy tipped it out of the air, and then it hit Nurse's skate and skipped into the corner. Yeah, like it that was, was a double tough. bounce, and that was just luck. That and then the other luck. one goes off Kubalik's body into the net. Like there's two. Uh, he can, no, he got a stick on that. There was oh, a he really did. Good replay. Yeah, yeah, no, that was a great deflection yeah, by that, Kubalik. He had an outstanding game. A couple San Jose goals there, and um, yeah, they'll get you every time. This yeah. was a very, uh, yeah. Okay, Bruce, my bad thing was McDavid and Drysaddle at even strength. Mm-hmm. And McDavid was minus three and a direct culprit on uh, um, one of the goals where he lost the puck behind the net. Um, neither of them had any, like, I don't think I've ever seen such a McDavid performance where he had nothing going. Like, he just, he had nothing going. He, five he on was five. He wasn't skate on the power play. He was a different player. He's fantastic. The, you know, the power play was obviously fantastic. Yeah, and that's fit great. Five on five, though, like what that line had? Did they have any offensive zone time? Nugent Hopkins, Cassie, and McDavid. They they had nothing going on, zero. And they, so, I really hope they go back to the dynamite line next game and put with McDavid. I would put McDavid Bruce with Athanasio and Ennis, and um, see how that goes. At this point, Athanasio showed some jump. He's a fast player. Ennis is a is a is a good player. Just try something else because that line with Nugent Hopkins, Cassian, and McDavid had zero chemistry. Nothing going on all game long. Um, and McDavid then, McDavid played 16 minutes at even strength, and in that time, the the Hawks outshot the Oilers 14 to five and outscored them three to nothing. How can you win? You're going to, you lose, if Connor McDavid, if that's his playoffs, they're going to lose, be out in three. He can't have that himself. He's got to do better himself. And he's got to get, he's got to, they got to figure out the line mate situation pronto. There was, I think, Ennis looked good with McDavid, I thought, uh, in the regular season, had some good games. Play him there. Maybe Ennis, Cassie, and McDavid might work. Or you could try Athanasiu and put Nygaard in the, you know, I don't know if you're going to bench Cassian or not, but if he plays like that, why not? Um, and I don't know if Nygaard's ready, but um, they've got to change up those lines. And dry subtle, the dry subtle line was a little better, honestly, Bruce. Dry subtle, Yam- Yamamoto at least was hitting, but that line had very little going on as well. And um, they, they had a couple they, of shifts. They, had, they did. They had more offensive zone time. They were okay. You just know dry subtle and Yamamoto are they're, they're so good together. Something's going to happen, but. With Nugent Hopkins, that's an irresistible combination. Get that line back together. And I think, I don't think there's any excuse at this point for not doing that. You you tried, didn't work, go back to what works. So I'm going to be, I'm already getting uh, worked up about being ticked off next game if I don't see that. But uh, hopefully we'll see that, Bruce. Yeah, well, we saw, I mean, we did see some chemistry on the power play between Nugent Hopkins and um, David, but we sure didn't see much of it at even strength. And that was the whole point of that shift was to get uh, get some skill on uh, on McDavid's wings. Well, it was uh, well. It's one of those games where it's almost you know you're pointing fingers while you don't have enough fingers to point. There was enough culprits in this game. <laughs> I only got ten fingers, man. There's a lot of players that had a tough day. This is a fingers and toes kind of game. Yeah. Um, because that's enough to cover the whole team. Let's go. Let's go to our good things. We were going to start with the good things, but I forgot to do that. Anyway, we needed to rant. We have now officially ranted. We will probably rant some more before this is all over. But uh, Bruce, your good thing. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Alex Chason, who I thought had an excellent game. I thought, to, to my eye, he was uh, uh, he was bringing it all game long on the fourth line, on the power play. He was banging. He was he was. Um, uh, he was battling on the boards. He was playing with some kind of urgency and desperation, which really stood out for the first 40 minutes in particular, during which time he contributed in a significant way to six grade-A scoring chances for the Oilers. And he himself had very tough puck, puck block, uh, rattling one shot off the post and another deflection off the crossbar and the post in the dying seconds of the middle frame. And uh, uh, doing his, his usual excellent work down low in front of the blue paint that was a was a uh, a big contributor to the Oilers power play goal that opened the scoring and I just saw I I, I thought 
chase on play as good a game as you could hope for from a guy in that position. And uh, uh, he did his job in, in uh, both areas that he plays, even strength and, and uh, uh, power play. And to me, he was, you know, to me, he was the best oiler on the ice. And, and the flip side of that is you can say, well, when Alex Chason is your best player, you're probably in trouble, and, you know, which is not a slight on the player. It just means that uh, he was bringing his A game and other bigger stars were not. Yeah, yeah he, he was sure, certainly a big part of the power play, and the, including the first goal mm-hmm. where he was screening and um, as McDavid shot. And yeah. Clefbaum also was good on that goal. Uh, he just made the, of course, the quick pass over to I think it was to Drysaddle who uh, set up McDavid and and you get the nice goal. Um, yeah, I thought the whole fourth line, that grind line of Neil, Kara, and Chason, was consistently the best, most going on line for the Oilers. Seemed the least rattled out there, mm-hmm. most determined to get something done, knowing how to get something done. So I liked uh, I liked Chason's game as well. Could be we'll see maybe we'll see Chase on and Neil on the top line. Who knows? Like um, stranger things could happen than put McDavid with two veterans who know how to play a bit. I was uh, a little surprised not to see um, McDavid and or Drysaddle double shift with those guys from time to time, especially with the Oilers trailing. I mean, uh, Jujar Kara, it's you know he's a he's a versatile player, but no one's going to confuse him with a playmaking center. Yeah. And when you got, you know, two two guys on the wing with some history of scoring, maybe that's a real good place to slot your your uh, superstar pivots from time to time, just to get them an extra shift here and there and, and maybe get those uh, those big bangers going. Well, they only, you know, they only fought, played with them on the power play. And Neil, of course, was out there on the six on five. And that's when Edmonton got all their goals, because when... Uh, when one of those big guys, at least one of them, was was on the ice in a you know an extra man situation, but it was one where five on five double shift, one of your big guns in there once once or twice a period. Why not? But never happened that I saw. Maybe it did. Yeah, but. the others were so out of sync. Eh? They just all their best players were totally out of sync. Not one of them played very well. I don't think not one of the not one of the top players at even strength aside from the power power play, but not one of those guys. Their top four D. Their top four forwards, maybe Yamamoto was okay because he was hustling like crazy and hitting, but uh, even he couldn't get anything going making a play. Right. So, yeah, there was not anything encouraging from the Oilers' best players. And if your best players get whipped at even mm-hmm. strength, um, that's not you're not going to win. So uh, pretty miserable night. The Oilers, those, those, we're, it's going to be a real interesting test to see where these guys are. I think there needs to be tactical changes, but also, you know, we'll see where they are motivationally in terms of getting it together and being able to figure out how to assert themselves in a game like that's going to be played on Monday night. Uh, my my good thing, Bruce Koskinen, the second he came in the game, I just felt uh, a wave of confidence. And um, the Kublik goal was oh, unstoppable. You know, no one's going to stop it. Other than that, he was perfect. He he um, played very well. There was a there was one sequence on the uh, Chicago power play where he made two bang bang saves that were just utterly fantastic. And he's just, I, I think he I think and I'm hoping he's the kind of goalie that can get Chicago's number. Chicago is a team of shooters, not a team of going to the net so hard, but of shooters. And you get this huge man mountain in the net like that. And I think he's the kind of guy who could cause some trouble for a shooting team, a team that kind of th- tries to thread the needle a lot. And I thought he was good. So I'm looking forward to seeing him get a, a the start on Monday night. He was first star in the first two games he played against Chicago last season. And then this year, he never got a sniff other than that one. You know, Smith started all three games and, and Costman came in in relief the one time and slammed the door. But he hasn't seen a lot of the Hawks and... Maybe that needs to change. In fact, no maybe about it. <laughs> Indeed. What is your number? I'm going to go with this crazy number 47, uh, which is a number of hits credited to the orders in this game. And maybe because there's no fans there, but that's about the quietest 47 hits that I can remember. Like they're saying they were banging bodies, but I don't remember any sort of 
I, there was times I was sort of grumbling away to the TV, hit somebody, hit somebody, like, you know, hammer somebody, knock them down kind of thing. And maybe Adam Larson with about six minutes left in garbage time when he creamed Patrick Kane into the end boards. That, that was sort of the only time that I thought, that, you know, that's a real strong, solid physical check that's going to take a toll. But I, I didn't see enough of that. I was really disappointed in Cassian. Like, that's normally his game, even when other stuff isn't going on, that that he's going to be laying on the body. He took one, had one little hit on Duncan Keith that was nothing particularly special and otherwise <sighs> non-factor in the game. <sighs> and zero shot attempts for Cassian. I mean, start with that. If you want to talk about numbers, how about zero? That's a... <laughs> Zero shots for three of the four wingers in the top six, by the way. He Ennis, may have been... Ennis, zero. Yamamoto, zero. Cassian, zero shots. Jeez, how was that headshot on Ennis not a penalty? I mean, could Puck you... over glass, penalty, headshot, them. no problem. Anyway, I like, yeah. hockey sometimes. Cassian <laughs> might have been the worst orders forward that game. He just really got nothing done. And um, I think he'll play next game, but it would be... If he, yeah. if he didn't, I wouldn't. You know, they need him to play better. Yeah, well, that's oh, it's a got to be a wake up call for a whole bunch of these guys. And you'd like to think Lock, Stock, and Barrow they're going to be looking in the mirror tonight and saying, "We're better than that. I'm better than that. We're going to be a different team on Monday night." Because if they're not, man, you think it's been a long summer? Just imagine how long the fall will be. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> I don't want to think about it. They, they just got to win that next game. You don't want to be too o down. So that you know. They have they have uh, some self reckoning to do. Of, do. We really want to be serious about being a playoff contender. We got to roll up our sleeves and get to work and play solid two hundred foot hockey. Get the dynamite line going. Get Koskinen in that. Get McDavid with some new line mates and see and and everyone just you know tighten your chin straps and and get going and see what happens. And I think I think they can beat this team and hit just hit mm -hmm. hit 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 hit. Play physical against Chicago because I think that's the a right the right strategy against this team, and the Oilers have players who can hit. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruce, my number is eight and seven, and those were the major mistakes on Grade A scoring chances made by Oscar Kleffbaum and Adam, Adam Larson, respectively. Eight by Oscar Kleffbaum. These this is your top pairing yeah. defense, and 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 five by Larson at even strength. Two two both. Two for both of them on the penalty kill. Clefbaum, that was his worst game all year, I think, Bruce. Um, he just, and Larson was just a step, like I said, a step behind mm -hmm. all game long. He just was hitting people on the boards and then kind of wandering slowly back into the play. And it cost them on the fourth Chicago goal, or excuse me, the, the fourth Chicago goal, the second Chicago goal, he was way in the corner. Larson was when he's on the power on the, when he's on the penalty kill should have been in guarding in front of his own net. He just was for a veteran. He had yeah, a, he, he just had a non-veteran, terrible, rotten game. And Clef, like these guys against San Jose, Bruce, when when the owners won a playoff series, these guys were the two best defensemen on the team. They need these guys to yeah. quickly snap out of it. Like wake the frack up and play your best, play your grade A hockey. Can you do? Can they do that? Mm -hmm. Are these guys just too rusty to do that? To quickly get it together and play this because that was an unacceptable performance by those two hockey players well, that they need better from. Larson was very undisciplined, not in, on the penalty aspect, which you usually associate with that word, but he was just kind of wandering around the zone and not really holding his position. And a few times I thought, "What are you doing over there?" And, and a couple of times, I was quickly saying. There's another one in the net, you know, I mean, where he just seemed to be kind of wandering around and and didn't really seem to have his bearings. And, and uh, that's a little bit difficult to accept from, you know, a 27-year-old veteran. Now, granted, this was the first game in 20 weeks for all these guys, and we have to give them some leeway for that. But, I mean, we we're judging the game in front of us, David. And, uh, I mean, if you're an Oilers fan and you like what you see in that game, I mean, you know, I don't know how you could put those two together. So <sighs> it was, uh, it was a tough afternoon for a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, normally explosive and or reliable players. Indeed, Bruce. Indeed. Well, the good thing is there's, it's a five game series. It's not a one game series. 
And the best um, of five series. The Oilers have to win three out of the next four, which they're perfectly capable of doing. I think they can beat the Chicago team, but this is a, this is a very dangerous team that can score. That's what we were all saying going in. Jonathan Taves, very dangerous player at even strength. You know, the the eleventh top scorer in the NHL at even strength scored at a higher rate than Connor McDavid at even strength this year. So this is the challenge, and um, it's a it's a big one, and. The Oilers get last change. Who would you play against Taves? I mean, I think the Shea line should be out there against the Taves line, personally. What what would you say? Well, if you have the last change, you you, you know, if, if you had a, you know, a checking line, that would be the one. I mean, Kubelik's the guy. I mean, holy moly, he was great in this game. I mean, yeah. it was him that Koskinen made those two great saves on. There was a two or three other times, like, he got five points, and he could have even had more. Yeah. And, you know, it was... Uh, uh, the, the chemistry between him and Taves was uh, impressive, but uh, whoever you put on him, you need you know you need the guys bearing down on the defensive side of the puck, and we just didn't see near enough of that in the first 40 minutes today. And that was an adjustment that Colleton made before the be, just right before the first playoff game against. Uh, St. Louis before the first exhibition game, the first and only exhibition game, he put to, he, he had these other lines going with Kubelik with Doc, and he just said no, we're going to go with a power line, and he put it together. And the owners have got to uh, maybe the dynamite line, put them mm-hmm. against the Taves line, and make them play in their own zone, make Chicago play. So I'm I'm hoping I see that, and I'm going to be one unhappy. Oilers fan if I do not and what I don't want to see is McDavid and Dreisaitl go back to that and I, I don't think we'll see that no I don't either but it's a possibility so <sighs> anyway Any well last come, we got more questions and answers after that game that's for sure that's, yeah. uh, I mean the, here's here's the good news I mean the, the, normally when you lose the first game at home you think well we lost home ice advantage for the series but uh not in this series. All the games are going to be in Edmonton. Mind you, it's a bit of a mixed bag. And, you know, being the home, being in your own rink is all well and good. But weird things, like, I have half an idea. And this may be a reach, but I just I have half an idea that the Oilers playing their home barn, but being on the wrong bench, opposite bench to what they're used to. I mean, some of that stuff would that seem harder to the home team than it would to a visiting team that's used to just adapting to whatever the situation is and whatever rink they're going to. And that, you know, it, it's just a minor thing, but when you see a team that played it discombobulated as Edmonton did in this game, you wonder, if, you know, what contributed to that? And those, those little factors, you know, Did the probably, owners have the wrong bench? Like, weren't the they were on the wrong team? bench and going why, in the wrong direction. Why the wouldn't first... they be on the right bench? Like, they're the home team. Wouldn't they be on the home team they were bench? In the, they were in the dressing room, but they were in the right dressing room, but on the wrong bench. They talked about that right at the beginning of the broadcast. But why were they going on the wrong bench? They, they was assigned specific dressing rooms to specific benches. And because there's so many... Because there's so many uh, dressing rooms that are in play here, I think six, they have to, you know. It's the closest. They went to the closest yeah. dressing room. To the bench. I guess so. I mean, I, I don't know the exact layout down there to be able to say. All, all I know is they were in a, on a different side than we were used to all year. And Can't you give them their own dressing room. room for the first freaking game? Like, didn't they earn anything all year long? Give them their own dressing room and their own bench. They had their own dressing room. They, they did. Didn't have so why don't they go to the regular bench? Like well, anyway. Anyway, it's it's maybe a little thing, but it's just I mean there was they, they were thrown off and who knows what did it, but little sort of unreal things like that couldn't have helped. I blame that entirely. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was weird. I couldn't like it did seem. I noticed it at one point. I wasn't. I didn't hear that. I wasn't listening to that part of it, but. Uh, Oh, man. Anyway, Bruce, that was not fun. Hopefully Monday night will be a lot more fun. And I think it will be. I think this Oilers team has something to show. And I, my prediction is they will show it on Monday night. They're going to need to, David. They are going to need to. All right. You're doing the game grades? I am doing the game grades. And we will get working on cracking on that. I got a lot of notes here and I got to translate them into individual comments and try not to say anything I regret as I may have already done in this podcast. <laughs> Tough to grade McDavid, eh? Because there's the 
Oh man, the four points. Play, four points. I mean, the, that's an eight, isn't it? <laughs> that's that's an eight, it, is. it could be the first time a player gets a failing grade with a four point game. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to fail him, but I'm not. I'm not exactly going to going to uh, rave about his game because you know the lion's share of it was at even strength, and in that part of the game, he and his his line were second best on the ice consistently. All right, let's leave it there. Thanks for talking, Bruce. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. Better, better game next time. And in the meantime, and in between times, this is the Cult of Hockey podcast.